Welcome to the Red Light Report, your number one source for all things red light therapy, where you will learn how to optimize your health, wellness, and longevity with the power of photobiomodulation. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Belkowski. All right, guys, welcome back. Another week in the books, and here we are on the Red Light Report. This week, for the first time ever, we have a expert from Montana. It's none other than Julie Nelson in Missoula, Montana, my hometown, when she has over 20 years of experience working in behavioral health, and she has a background in both social work and youth engagement. Uh, she is a certified neurofeedback specialist, and in 2018, she received advanced neurofeedback training in the other method at the EEG Institute in California. Her training includes synchrony, alpha, theta, trauma, and infralow frequency. Julie is experienced and adept at working with children, teens, and adults with an emphasis on trauma. And we have a lot of fun stuff to cover on this podcast, Julie. So without further ado, welcome to the Red Light Report. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. So we know each other through a mutual connection, and I've heard nothing but amazing things about you and the work you do treatment-wise. And with neurofeedback, based on your bio as well, kind of one of your strong suits. And this is something I'm not very well versed in other than what I've heard. I haven't done a deep dive myself, but we were talking before we pressed the record button here about your interest in energetic healing and all the energetic modalities you also use. So I guess before we get into the trenches, Julie, give us a background about kind of your origin story, how you got into this type of energetic healing in a world that's, dare I say, overrun with allopathic medicine. Mm -hmm. I would say it was about 20 years ago, more like 19, where I was introduced to a practitioner who really focused in the area of body talk. And to me, it made perfect sense as far as understanding that the brain and the body sort of work together. And when we have experiences in our life, typically trauma, the body sort of gets stuck in those areas. And essentially, it can block energy in your body. And the concept of body talk is that the body actually is communicating with the practitioner on what it needs help with, what it needs cleared. And so that's really how I got into that 18 years ago. But I think the reason that I was drawn to it is when I was 18, my dad was diagnosed with a glioblastoma. And for me, I was noticing, this is sort of how my brain has always worked. I was really aware that there were a lot of these 40-year-old to 50-year-old, there were our, you know, my friends' parents that were getting cancer. And I was able to make the observation that we, you know, our grandparents are still alive. So something happened between these two generations that flipped some switch on and not knowing anything at that time, my hypothesis was that it was food. And that was my first thing. But then when I did, I did my own research paper in college on glioblastoma, the only thing that they could really tie directly to glioblastomas was stress. And my dad was a workaholic. He was a very kind man. He was a sensitive man. And he worked a lot. And I believe he worked a lot because he was trying to prove himself all the time. And so there was this sort of dissonance in his need to prove himself, but yet be this engaged family man. And I was able to, through my research, really come to the conclusion that I really feel like his stress and not living by his constitution is what brought on the glioblastoma. That was my conclusion when I was 18 years old. So I just really like glommed on to that whole idea and it was very interesting to me. So when I discovered a practitioner who did body talk made perfect sense to me. And it's always something I've pursued for me and my family. That's a very captivating story and at, at 18 years old to have that intuition. But just to go back to the energetic aspect or body talk, you said the practitioner kind of reads the person, so to speak. What is the practitioner, quote unquote, seeing? What are they looking for more descriptively? Because to us, 
common people like myself when it comes to body talk, I wouldn't know what I'm looking at. It just seems like a person. But from books I've read, and we talked about this again before the recording about this book I'm reading, I just did a podcast on it. I can't remember if it was a week or two ago, Electric Light, Electric Health, talking about the biofield, which gave me more of a comprehension of what that, again, looks like. But from your practitioner perspective, what are you looking for? What are you seeing? And how are you deciphering the other person's energetic code? So I, I'm not a practitioner, so I don't engage in it. But I do talk to the practitioners oh, gotcha. who do body talk. And I use it in conjunction. I like my patients to do body talk in conjunction with neurofeedback. And the way I understand it is that it's always been explained to me in terms of quantum physics that energetically we all have this energy field that can be tapped into and the practitioner is able to sort of tune into the patient's body and that body essentially speaks to the practitioner and it's at the strangest thing because we as patients don't really understand what's happening but the practitioner has learned to listen to the body signals while it's asking the body questions. And it's really, I think, for the practitioner's perspective, just learning the body's language. And then the practitioner can clear, like going back to my dad, you look at how he was, you look at a person like him, and if you can clear those inconsistencies within the person's living and story and their narrative, if you can clear those, you can help the body's energetic pathways actually get restored. And then your all these systems in your body work a lot better. So that's the idea behind body talk. But when you add it to other modalities, you're getting this super powered treatment for the body mentally and physically and emotionally. And so you said you've had body talk done, correct, Julie? I have, yeah. So what did you notice, maybe let's say the first time, I don't know how many times you've had it done, but what did you notice after the first treatment? Well, this is a very interesting story. I was pregnant with my second child and the practitioner noticed that I was bigger than I should be for four months and I didn't think anything about it, but I had heartburn and all this great stuff. And he said, it looks like there's something not quite right. So he just worked on me, and what he found is that the baby was pushed up high against my diaphragm because the birth of my first child, it was a little bit of a stressful birth for the baby, for my first child, and there was a lot of pain for me and the baby, and the uterus remembered it. So this baby was kind of avoiding that area and was pushed up really high against my diaphragm. So he just treated it and he treated it through, it's called tapping. So he tapped it out essentially and I watched my stomach settle. And that was the first time I've ever experienced body talk and I was hooked from that point on. All my symptoms went away and the baby just sat lower. So So it was just a great example of the body, like, you know, holding on to that trauma. Yeah, that's uh, that's a see it to believe it type of thing. Um, It is. Or like that proof in the pudding, I should say, from from a (laughs) from a um, patient standpoint. Yes. So so is the tapping um, there? There's a popular book out there called The Tapping Solution. I I actually Mm -hmm. I haven't read it yet, but is that more or less the same concept or are they intertwined in a way? this this body talk and the tapping solution? You know, I think there's a lot of different ways that it's used, but in, in terms of body talk, the idea is you are calling attention to the mind and the heart. So um, tapping, tapping on the forehead and then tapping on the heart. And it's you're essentially waking the body up, waking it up and, and um, helping it remember what it already knows to do, which is it naturally wants to be healthy and heal itself and it knows how to, it's essentially forgotten. So by doing this, you are waking up the brain and waking up the heart to do what it knows to do. 
is this something the the tapping um is this something you do for yourself let's say on a daily or on a semi-consistent basis or is this only something maybe you'd want to do therapeutically every once in a while it's only something that i have ever done with a a practitioner sometimes they will prescribe it to me when you're home tonight i want you to do the tapping three times or something like that and it's a way to treat yourself at home basically extending the protocol that they've already used on you that day then it will help continue the treatment process over time by tapping that protocol on yourself over a few days sometimes a week it just depends on whatever on what the body needs to be treated for gotcha kind of like a home exercise program that's something i'm familiar with yes (laughs) yeah (laughs) um Okay, body talk. Is this something, let's say, you could do prophylactically, meaning let's say you could do it maybe once every couple of months or once every six months or once a year just to be proactive with your health? Or is this, again, only something you would seek out if you're dealing with something or on the precipice of dealing with something? Well, my opinion, again, I'm not the body talk practitioner, so this is just from my personal experience being a patient is depending on the practitioner you go to and how efficient they are, I would say most people can get what they need in three to five sessions where you can really shift the body. I have used it throughout my life, throughout 20 years, and my children too. I've used it on them since they were babies. And I do think that you can target certain things with body talk. For example, if I noticed that I was we call it dysregulated, where I felt more anxiety or I felt foggy or something wasn't quite right, I would usually go to a body talk person. I have two practitioners that I go to off and on, and they could get right in there, figure out what was going on, and clear it, essentially. So you can use it just for, you know, general maintenance, and you can also use it situation by situation. I personally think that it's a really good thing for everyone to do on a continuous basis. Well, guys, BioLite has what's called bundles. So simply go to the BioLite website, BioLite.shop, go into products, and there will be a tab for bundles. With each of these bundles, there's three of them, you save 20% off on the entire package. For example, we have the Beauty Bundle, which includes a Shine and Stand, a Guardian Plus, and the Longev Revive Cream. So that bundle of three products, you save 20% off the entire package. There's the Recovery Bundle. That includes the Recharge Plus panel, the Guardian mouthpiece, and then the Longev recover cream and that recover cream is just like the revive cream except it has added cbd oil infused into it that package of three items all comes at 20 percent off and then the last bundle which is the most versatile bundle in the sense that you get to pick and choose what products you want you get to pick and choose from the recharge plus panel the restore plus panel or the matrix full body mat and then you get to choose between the guardian and guardian plus and then you get to choose between the revive and the recover cream it also includes the shine and stand so you get to choose between black and silver by purchasing those four products in the ultimate bundle you save 20 percent off all of the products you also save 20 percent off shipping so literally the entire package and shipping is 20 percent off so if you're ever needing some red light therapy products and are looking for a discount just remember the bundles are always 20 percent off 365 days a year no coupon code necessary yeah really anything energetic wise seems like a pretty good winner winner chicken dinner just because it's mm-hmm. as i preach about red light therapy it's non-invasive non-pharmaceutical a lot of these things you can do in the comfort of your home and even with body talk from what i've learned you can basically do virtually because based on you know quantum biology or whatever you want to call it you know how everything is connected at all places at all times you don't need to be in their office for them to be able to treat you which is kind of mind blowing still is to me that's right I'm actually going to be able to experience that at the end of this week on Friday. So I'll have some feedback for you, perhaps. (laughs) It will blow your mind. (laughs) Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah, a little, my body could use it. Let's just put it that way. Um, (laughs) Well, I think something just to, just to add to that, you know, in this day and age with, I feel like we're constantly being inundated with environmental toxins and emotional toxins. And I feel like it's more prevalent now than ever. And I just, it's difficult to clear our bodies. 
And this is a wonderful way to do it passively, but effectively. You're really getting to the origin of the problem. Yeah, that was going to be my other point too, is uh, it sounds quite efficient. Uh, you said three to five sessions, and I know that varies on either side, but compare that to being on a pharmaceutical for years, if not the rest of your life, depending on what you're dealing with, or going and having a surgery, or just um, having this low-level disease that you just never deal with, and then all of a sudden, you get diagnosed with cancer one day. So Absolutely. have something that works that quickly and that effectively. And like, to your point, it's treating the root cause. That's the real deal. And speaking of which, let's get to your wheelhouse here a little bit more. Neurofeedback. So for the audience's sake and for my sake too, tell us what neurofeedback is, how it works, and what it's used for. Yeah. So neurofeedback was discovered, I would say, about 35 years ago. And the concept is a little similar actually to body talk in that the brain knows how to behave at its optimal level, but it just doesn't know when it's misbehaving. And neurofeedback is really the first time and the only way that the brain can actually see how it's behaving. What we do is we use electrodes to work as microphones for the neuronal activity in the brain, those electrodes go through our program, our software program, and it gets organized in that program and then sent to the TV that's sitting in front of the patient. And what the patient is doing is they're just watching the screen. And in our case, we use Netflix or YouTube, whatever the client wants to watch. But the fluctuation is happening on the screen, and that fluctuation is connected to what's happening neuronally in the, in the brain. So in that moment, the brain is realizing, oh, I didn't know that I was anxious. I didn't know I was in a fight or flight, or I didn't know that I was too low, or whatever it is, it recognizes it and it fixes it in that moment. So it's really similar to... If you are walking by a window and you look at your reflection and see that you might be hunching over, you're going to stand up straight. You're going to fix it because you noticed you were doing it. It's the same thing with the brain. It didn't realize that it was misbehaving. So it corrects it right away and then the program rewards it. So every time it does the right thing, it gets rewarded. And basically what we're doing is we're creating a new behavior or pattern for the brain. And then the more we do, the more we reward it. And then eventually it just creates a new pathway, essentially. And that's where it likes to hang out. There are times where it will kind of go back into default mode. And usually it's when a person gets sick or maybe if they get a high fever or something, or if they get a head injury, then the brain might go back to its default mode. But we know now that when you bring neurofeedback back into the picture, it'll remind the brain and it kicks into that new way that we trained it. So it's actually highly effective and it, and it can last for a long time with the idea that if we need to remind it along the way, we can and the brain will remember what to do. Fascinating. Fascinating stuff, especially dealing with such a sensitive organ and special organ like the brain. So what exactly are the fluctuations on the screen that happen? Is it something where it's like breaking up the image on the screen so you can't really see it or it distorts it? And then what is the reward? The fluctuation on the screen is the picture will get really, really small or it might fade a little bit. And we also experience it in the volume. The volume might change a little bit. That's when the brain is trying to correct whatever it is that's wrong or misbehaving. And then when the reward is when the picture gets big. So if you think of it in terms of watching TV, if you're watching a show and the picture gets really tiny, it's going to be irritating. When it gets big, that's more comfortable. You're going to like seeing that on the screen. That's what's happening with your brain. Your brain is trying to work through a problem. When it gets it, it gets big again. And that's the reward. Interesting. So it's kind of gamifying creating more positive, I guess we'll call it positive, neural connections. Absolutely. A lot of neurofeedback used to be games 
getting certain things to happen on the screen with the brain. But the Othmers, who are the ones that created the system that I use, they wanted it to be more passive for the client. So they developed the program that allows you to just sit and watch a show and your brain does all the work versus having to sit there and make something happen on the screen with your brain. And so that, that's interesting. Were you utilizing this from the, the gaming software to the current software? Or have you only been using this Netflix YouTube software? Yeah, this is the only one I have ever used. I know there are others out there that do use games. And we do have games on ours, but it's more your traditional way of playing a game. There's other ways through playing a game that you might get the feedback. Most of the time, people want to choose Netflix or YouTube. At one point, I do know that the Othmers did do, I think it was probably 15 years ago, they did utilize games more in that traditional sense. And then they decided to switch over to the TVs to make it easier, too, for children mm. to come in and do this. That makes it sense. was much easier to get them to sit and watch a show on TV. And then once they sat down and they were in front of the screen, the brain was doing all the work and you could actually watch the child sort of settle in the chair. And I actually saw that with it. I worked on a 10-month-old and I wasn't sure how I was going to get him to settle. But the minute he looked at the screen, his body just settled and he sat there for 20 minutes while I worked on him. So it's wonderful because the brain is doing all the work and that's very appealing to children. It's very appealing to a lot of people that don't like to really, the idea of therapy is difficult because they don't want to go through the trauma or the stories they can sit and just experience the treatment. Yeah, that that's interesting. And the reason I asked that question is I was going to see if you had noticed, like, let's say a before and after, like the difference between gaming versus this uh, newer software. But regardless, I see your point to the positivity of the passivity, or if that's the word, uh, being passive versus active makes people coming back easier, right? Like you were speaking to. Yes. Uh, my next question was going to be, what do you feel, you kind of alluded to this, but a little more specifically, what do you feel when you're being treated? So you say that your brain's working while you're watching something, but are you necessarily perceiving what's happening as it's happening or what's going on as you're sitting there? No, that's a good question. It's different for each person. Some people are very self-aware and in tune to their symptoms. And they can even have more of a sensitive brain or sensitive nervous system. And they can feel their body kind of, we call it drop. So they kind of settle in and experience a relaxation that they haven't felt in a while. Some people feel tingling. Um, most of the time, I would say for most of the people I work on, it's fairly undetectable in the moment. It's really afterward that people notice, you know, a change in their symptoms, meaning if it's anxiety or if it's if it's racing heart or chest tightness or headaches, um, whatever it may be, they will notice that afternoon, evening, the next morning that something is a little less or even a little more. And then that's, you know, giving us information on what we need to do as practitioners on that patient. I have had, you know, very odd symptoms can come up too, where I've I even had a client that started salivating <laughs> <laughs> and was concerned. And I said, that's all very normal. I mean, anything really is when we're doing a treatment on you, anything that occurs within that treatment time, we are going to associate with neurofeedback and we're going to use it as a symptom that's telling us what we need to change in that moment. And so, so with neurofeedback, what are the most common use cases? I would say that in most cases, I am treating anxiety. And even if the person is coming to me for something else, 
I can usually trace it back to anxiety. A very hyper-excitable central nervous system, most oftentimes due to unresolved trauma. There are cases where people just were born that way, and their systems have just always run high, and so we can just calm that, calm that central nervous system, address the anxiety, address the PTSD. But it's also really helpful for learning disabilities. I have a lot of clients that come to me with ADD that is actually not ADD. It's many other things, but they didn't know. And we, through neurofeedback, can the more sessions we do on a person, we can sort of peel away layers and see what the source really is. For example, what my younger son, I was pretty sure he had ADD. But as I worked on him, I realized it was really just anxiety. And he was, it was sort of hijacking his executive function part of his brain. So it appeared like ADD, but it actually wasn't. It was just generalized anxiety. Interesting. Well, this is a loaded question, but like how many treatments on average or for a typical, there's no such thing as a typical treatment, everyone's different, but how many treatments would it take to see appreciable differences? We say minimum 20. And the reason 20 is the magic number is through clinical studies and research and repetition, we find that 20 sessions is the sweet spot. That seems to be the amount that the brain needs to hold. Now, depending on what's going on with each patient, some need 40. It just depends on what is happening. I will say, though, that younger children, we can get by with 20 in a lot of them, a lot of the cases, because their brains are new and they're just sort of pliable, where older patients have really, really deep pathways and deep habits, and letting go of those can be challenging, and it takes a lot of coercing the brain to let go of some of those things. But oftentimes, too, these symptoms that these people have been experiencing can kind of slip out the back door, and they don't really realize that it's gone until we start talking about, you know, I'm asking questions about symptoms and experiences and how you responded in that situation. And then there's sort of this aha moment where they realized, oh, I did not respond in that situation the same way that I have my whole life, and I didn't even realize it. So it can be kind of elusive. It's not this extreme response to a treatment. It can be really subtle at first. And I imagine given the past three years, let's say, you've probably been pretty busy regarding to stress and anxiety in this country. Did you notice any patterns or any shifts, let's say pre-COVID to during COVID to let's say now? Did you notice anything interesting? Yes, a lot of brain instability from COVID. So prior to COVID, I would say I was treating mostly anxiety, some ADD. And I'm in 2020, not 2000. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Um, And, you know, once COVID hit, what I saw a lot of was instability in the brain. And how I describe that for people is instability would show up as a lot of physiological symptoms like asthma, migraines, restless leg, nausea, things like that. Even tinnitus is another one that we saw a lot of. And then how that works, as far as neurofeedback is concerned, is it really indicates that we need to balance both sides of the brain. So I use a boat as an example. It's as though like like a boat that's in um, wavy water rocks really heavily back and forth. And that's really what we were seeing with the brain. So People coming in with COVID really needed us to balance that boat. So it's essentially working on both sides of the brain at the same time to restabilize it. But also what we found is that there was this extreme reaction um, or extreme um, elevation in anxiety, panic attacks, 
suicidal ideation. So it seemed to trigger like a predisposition in people, anybody who struggled with anxiety, depression, anything like that, when they contracted COVID and it became long COVID, it was this inflammation in the brain that created this extreme response to stress. And so we treated the brain by stabilizing it, but we also had to really calm it because it was hyper excitable at that point. I had a lot of clients going through that. So a lot of stabilizing through COVID. And once we stabilized it and calmed it, they did really well. I guess that's another question. Let's say you see the significant improvements 20 sessions later, 40 sessions later, what have you. Do those results hold? I know you said there can be times where people kind of revert back to that old self, but they can get back on the bike a little easier, so to speak. But in general, if someone heals or levels out that boat, is that something where it can last a long time? It can. It depends, again, on the person and what happens in their life going forward. But if you're just going along and don't have any significant things happening in your life, it can maintain forever. It just depends on how sensitive your brain is. But I've had several clients that have come and gone. And, you know, when I check back in with them years later, they're still doing really well. So it just depends on the individual. The other thing that's really neat about it, though, I think this is not talked about enough with neurofeedback is As far as the modality by itself, I would say it's extremely effective in just calming the system down and showing the system a proper way to deal with the kind of stress that we have today because our systems overreact to everything. It's a very common problem, as you know, in our society or in our world, actually, that we are inappropriately responding to stress. And so, what we can do with this treatment is calm that system down. And then the patient can actually implement tools, coping skills and tools that they've learned in therapy or through meditation or whatever. They can actually implement those things because their system is calmer. But if they're always in fight or flight, it's very difficult for somebody to access the tools that have been given to them because they really can't settle enough And in some cases, they can't even access that part of their brain that stores all that information. It's sort of hidden from that, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So is it fair to say that neurofeedback is a way for someone who's very much hyper in the sympathetic nervous system to train them to be able to more easily get into their parasympathetic and get to that calmer, more relaxed nervous system state? Yes, yes. Well, and there's several reasons that happens. One is that through neurofeedback and us just, we need to to really take inventory of a person's symptoms in order to understand where we treat the brain and what we need to do protocol-wise. But it also creates self-awareness in the patient. They start to really pay attention to their body's signals. And so they are more aware of what is happening in the moment and they can catch it faster. So that's part of just learning the body, but also the treatment allows the system to recover faster instead of hanging out in that fight or flight part of the brain. It's identifying pretty quickly like, oh, this is an inappropriate response. And the person is cognitively realizing what's happening. And so together, those two things help the person recover quicker. So they kind of flip back from the fight or flight. They go back into that like calmer state. And then that rational part of their brain starts to take over. Gotcha. No, that's fascinating. And then is this similar to a body talk where, like you alluded to, in this day and age of nonstop fight or flight, nonstop stress, it seems like, that neurofeedback could be used virtually on anyone to have a have a positive impact, I should say, on their quality of life? Absolutely. I, I don't really know of anybody that this would not be helpful for in one way or another. 
even in terms of pain, we can relax essentially the part of the brain, which is in most people, it's the parietal lobe, the right parietal lobe, which when we treat that area of the brain, it creates a relaxation in the body so we can relax the muscles that are holding a lot of tension. Um, the same with the temporal lobe. When we do that, that's where a lot of the instabilities are that we need to treat, but we can create a lot of relaxation in the body just working in the temporal lobe area. So you see a lot of relief from pain. And then, of course, people who have pain that's emotionally driven, we really can make an impact in that sense with those clients. That makes sense. And so are you saying that you, during a treatment or before a treatment, are you deciding where to target which part of the brain or are you allowing the person's brain to dictate that? So actually, we're, both are happening. In the beginning, we actually begin with an intake where clients are given a sheet of symptoms and they're just checking what symptoms they have. Based on that, we develop a protocol on where it is we want to put the electrodes on the brain. As the client is getting treated through these 20 sessions, I'm asking them questions in session. How are you feeling? Are you feeling any head pressure or headache or sleepy or whatever, along with encouraging them, you know, if anything comes up while I'm treating you, be sure to let me know everything matters. So there's nothing that's insignificant when we're doing neurofeedback because we're so used to ignoring symptoms that we have every day. I really have to encourage the client to identify what it is and share it with me. What that does is give me direction on, is this the right placement? And the other part of what we're doing is we're working with a frequency. So what the frequency is, is basically finding the right, it's like looking for the right radio station. You can, if you're not on the right radio station, you can sort of hear the music, but it's kind of staticky until you hit that spot. It's the same with the brain when we're doing neurofeedback. The frequency is really just trying to dial in the picture better for the brain. So we can't see this, we can't detect this, but the person's brain can look at the screen and it can tell that that's itself, but it might be a little bit fuzzy. And so that's when you get symptoms. And those symptoms then direct me to go up or down in frequency. So I'm always taking inventory, how the person's feeling, how they're responding in the session, and I'm moving my frequency on my end to get better results. So I'm chasing those symptoms is what we call them. And the ideal situation is that we can get those symptoms to go away. And then we know we're kind of in the right area for frequency. This is and then going yeah. Then going forward, we're how did you sleep last night? You know, what was your how did you wake up? Did you have energy when you woke up? I mean we have a list of symptoms we go through to see how their brain recalibrated over the next couple of days. And then we adjust based on that. And so with the frequency, is that like hertz? Are you like more or less injecting a frequency into the brain? Is that what you're saying? No, that's a good question. We are not injecting. We are only listening. So oh, the, the electrodes are just listening to the activity in the brain and it's just being recorded. So it's being recorded and going into the program, but the frequency is like tuning in the picture a little bit. So it's making the picture clearer for the brain. So nothing is going in, it's only going out. Interesting, okay, that's a good clarification. And as far as the tools that you have in your belt, so to speak, what do you use in combination, if you do, with neurofeedback to kind of get a synergistic result or response? So body talk is my modality of choice with with neurofeedback because once we've calmed the brain and stabilized it, we add another treatment to it called alpha theta. This is a great modality for treating trauma. On my end, what I'm doing is finding a way for the brain's 
the conscious part of the brain to communicate with the subconscious part of the brain, which is where trauma is stored. And so in that session, the conscious mind talks to the subconscious and starts clearing that trauma. When you add that to body talk, which is clearing the trauma in the body, you're getting this wonderful combination of the brain's subconscious clearing and then the body's storing of trauma is being cleared as well. And then you Oftentimes what we see is body talk practitioners can work deeper on the client and I can actually make bigger jumps in neurofeedback. So what I find is if people plateau when I'm working on them and we're not really getting improvements in an area, that's when I usually suggest at that point that body talk is a really good modality for them because it will get us over the hump. Same with therapy, you know, if if therapy is a great thing to do at that point, like we need to do some untangling in order for us to get some better results. It either one is going to help the client move to the next level. But my personal experience is that body talk is just so effective in working well with neurofeedback to make big gains as far as emotional health, and body health. And and so, of course, with neurofeedback, that has to be physical, in person, but body talk, because I was going to ask you, like, how easy is it for a person to find like a neurofeedback and a person that does body talk in the same region? But again, neurofeedback, you have to go to a physical location. Body talk, you can do from essentially anywhere in the world, right? Because you uh, can. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, so I guess that begs the question, For people around the U.S. or or in other countries, how easy or how common is it to find someone that does uh, neurofeedback effectively? So my feeling is that any neurofeedback is better than no neurofeedback. So you can really find neurofeedback anywhere in the country, but in many places in the world. Othmer method, which is what I use, I feel is unique in that it is so strong and it is refined and tailored to the client. So the client's specific needs, it's not a one size fits all. It's based on a person's individual symptoms and brain and needs. And because we are able to go to such low frequencies, we're able to create bigger change that lasts longer. So this kind of neurofeedback is, I believe it's in Europe and it is in the United States. I don't know that it is anywhere else in the world right now, but there's a big presence in Europe. So yeah, I mean, it's something that's growing and we're seeing it's something that people are talking about a lot more. There are home devices that can be used. And my feeling is that any of those things can be helpful to an individual on some level. And what is the method that you're a fan of? Othmer. So it's O-T-H-M-E-R. And it's the program they... I said the wrong thing in your bio. I must have clipped off the M and that's why I said other (laughs) method. And I was like, that's an interesting name, other method. But it's the Othmer (laughs) method. Okay. Glad we got the other method is very mysterious. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah, that that's an interesting one. But okay, go ahead. Yeah, so Othmer is actually it's actually named after Sue and Siegfried Othmer. They are the couple that started this, and that's a very interesting story. If I have time to tell it, it kind of explains why this program is so unique. Yeah, go for it. So they were both scientists. He's a physicist and she, I hope I don't get this wrong, but I think she was a neuropsychologist and they had children and experienced a lot of different things with their kids as far as symptoms. Their one child, Brian, had epilepsy, but they did not detect it. Sue herself had epilepsy and a lot of instabilities in her system. By the way, epilepsy is considered an instability in the brain. When her son, Brian, was 
growing up and getting a little bit older, he was having a lot of behavioral problems. And I thought it was really interesting because they had those fears and feelings that a lot of parents do. You know, we're loving parents. We are providing our kids with everything. Why? What is going wrong with this child? And as they did more testing, they found out that he was having seizures in his limbic brain. And so it was causing these behavioral outbursts. So they had tried medication. They'd done all these different things that weren't working. And they discovered a woman named Margaret Ayers who was doing something called neurofeedback 30 years ago. It worked really well for their son. So their belief at that time was this should be accessible for everyone. So they really wanted to work with Margaret to develop a system that was really effective, but that was also accessible to anyone who needed it. And that is how the process began. And they really dedicated their life to putting the science behind the program, making it better, making it stronger, making it more effective. Until and Sue Othmer just passed this year at the age of 85, I believe. And Siegfried is still the brains behind the program, continuing to make it better. So it's really cutting edge. Interesting. A lot of interesting information, Julie. This is this is good for for not just the audience, but me as well. So you're you're also interested in meditation, acupuncture, EMDR, of course, red light therapy, and myofascial release. So which one of those are you excited about right now? Whether you're using it for yourself or otherwise that you want to kind of expound upon? Well, of course, spread light therapy is something that I'm really learning about and exploring for clients that have a lot of physical issues. This is something that has been really helpful for me to refer them to. So I'm learning more about that. I think my next favorite thing is myofascial release, learning a lot about how our bodies store trauma And when we can find ways to break up and loosen that fascia and release that emotional trauma, again, we're just getting the system to work better, to work at its optimal best. Anything that allows the energy to flow within the body makes everything work better. So I've noticed that if I have a client that is struggling with pain from a surgery, we're constantly working on settling the nervous system, getting the body to settle. But if they're always dealing with this pain, that's usually when, so essentially I can get it to feel better in the session, but then a day later it hurts again. That's usually when I say, okay, we need to try it. We need to add something else. So, you know, I want you to go towards looking at the body and what's happening systemically in the body. And usually that's when I suggest body talk or myofascia, release or acupuncture in order to release what's being stored in the body. So anything like that is I get very excited about because when we combine the two, it's just a dynamic treatment. So what kind of tools do you use for the myofascial release? Well, I don't do myofascial release, but I have my list of practitioners that I send people to to go have the work done. Same with counter strain. Anything like that, that is kind of getting that, clearing the pathways for energetic flow. So basically what I see myself as is I am the neurofeedback practitioner, but I have a list of people that I refer, I network with to get as many services to help my client as possible. So we're kind of like this little community of people that work really well together and we communicate together on what it is this person needs, which I also think is missing in our medical field today. I just don't think doctors really talk to each other as much. And that's something I feel is really important when you're working with somebody is, this is my client's needs. This is what I'm seeing. This is what I think would be really good for them. What do you think? And then this practitioner can work with them and then we communicate on what we're seeing. And then I can adjust based on what this practitioner is telling me, 
even if the client may not be reporting very well what's happening, I can get that information from the other practitioner they're working with. And together we can really create change in this person's system. Yeah, to have that level of collaboration is is amazing. And so anyone that's able to get into your galaxy is lucky and be part of that system because and you you've said this, you know, neurofeedback by itself is is fantastic, but to add a couple of complementary techniques is where you really see some good results and you've said it multiple times neurofeedback and body talk to get those two paired together is simply amazing. And on top of that, to have two practitioners that are communicating effectively is like the best of all worlds. And again, like you said, there's just not enough of that. But hopefully, that's that's uh, the the paradigm you're you're treating under. It becomes more popular over time. Myofascial release. So that's treating collagen because that's basically what myofascia is, right? Is collagen. Mm-hmm. Again, I'm a novice in this area. I haven't read too much on it. But is it like communication and electricity, so to speak? travels along the fascia so if you have any area that's kind of bundled up or knotted up that disturbs mm-hmm. the communication and hence distorts or, or halts the the energy flow in that area yes yeah, so i am not an expert either but my experience talking with practitioners who do this and some of the reading i've done the fascia will get a little sticky and where that stickiness is it's it is obstructing, like you said, those currents, but also it inhibits the absorption of water. And so when you can break that up and loosen that a little bit, then you get this hydration of fascia and that flow starts to happen again, especially when we're when we have that trauma that gets stored in those areas of stickiness. When that gets released, then you have this it's like a highway that's had an accident and everything is piled up behind it. Once you clear that accident, everything starts to flow. It's the same thing with any of these things, body talk or fascia or meridians. You and I were talking about tuning forks and working along the meridians before we started the call. Anything like that is really, really helpful for the body's ability to heal on its own without the use of all these other things we try to do topically, it's really trying to get to that idea that the body does know what to do, which is such a new concept, I think, for a lot of people. We think that we need so much outside help, but really, if we just remind the body, clear it, center it, it's going to go and do what it knows to do. We've been indoctrinated to think we need someone else to fix a force, or we need a pill for that or the other. But like you said, the body is very resilient and you give it the energy or the frequency that it's yearning for and it will be relatively quick to heal and restore homeostasis. But the pendulum has been swinging towards the opposite of energetic healing for quite a while now. We could go into the history of the early 1900s and the Flexner Report and how basically alternative health and energetic healers basically got banished and their licenses mm-hmm. revoked, and that was the beginning of the end to a certain degree. So my hope, yep. as I'm sure yours is, is that we're starting to swing the pendulum back to becoming more independent with our healing, more independent with our health, and taking it into our own hands versus being reliant on on a outside source, whether that's a person or a, a pill or, or what have you. Well, regardless, Julie, this has been a really, really fascinating conversation. I've been looking forward to this for a while, so I'm glad we had the chance to sit down here. Do you have any other piece of information or intuition you want to share with the audience before we sign off here? You know, the only thing I think that's really important that I wish I would have known even when I was younger is that we really have to learn to trust our bodies and have faith in our bodies and to be nice to them, which sounds so strange. But I think that when we're so hard on our bodies and what they're not doing for us, that when we can focus on um, sort of the miraculous nature of a body and what it's what it can do and what it's supposed to do, and really when we emotionally support that, it can do amazing things. And that's the thing I think that's the most important message is really having 
courage to explore those things for optimal health. Agreed. Great message. Again, Julie, I really appreciate you taking the time to sit down and share your expertise with me and the audience. Well, thanks, Michael. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure I'm sure our paths will cross again, if not soon, sooner than later. Um, I might have to get you in my chair. Sounds like I need to, and I know I need to, <laughs> based on my lifestyle, speaking of <laughs> not being able to get into my parasympathetic as much as I should. Um, well, I can help you with that. <laughs> yeah, I'd appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate it, Julie. For Julie Nielsen, this is Dr. Mike Belkowski signing off of another episode of The Red Light Report. You all have a fantastic week, and I'll see you in the following episode. Thank you for listening to The Red Light Report. If you like what you heard today, go ahead and leave us a review on iTunes and other podcast platforms to help spread the word so other people can learn about the many health, wellness, and longevity benefits of red light therapy. If you're looking for more educational content, check out our Instagram page at biolite.shop and our YouTube channel, Biolite. I'm Dr. Mike Belkowski, and I'll see you on the next episode.